people won't believe. Excellent. Hi there, my name is Stuart Crichton, as Graham said earlier. Um, I kind of share my research between this school and the Institute of Neuroscience. So I bridge color image processing with um, human color vision studies. So trying to do more perceptually and human visual based image processing algorithms. So, as you can maybe tell from the title of um, my presentation, if you've seen the film Blade Runner, it's kind of inspired by uh, the main soliloquy in that film. So, Roy Batty, portrayed by Rutger Hauer, says in yeah, one line, I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. So this kind of idea, uh, this presentation kind of spans from that. What, how do we understand and perceive the world through images? And what can we do to kind of replicate that in systems? So, in order to do this, I'm going to set the stage for perceptual-based image processing algorithms. Uh, so, to do this, I'm going to have to compare camera vision systems, so RGB cameras, then compare that to the human visual system and the signals we get. And then also, using this, how can we base, um, using human visual studies, how can we base image processing algorithms on those findings? So, first of all, again, comparing computer vision and human color vision. Now, if you take a random object in front of you, uh, we're focusing on the kind of uh, human visual system here. When you look at it, say an apple, what, what do you notice? You notice the shape, the texture, and the color, among other features. Now, my talk's going to kind of concentrate only on the color features, but all of these are important, and we get all this information from our visual system. So, you may be asking why concentrate solely on color? I mean, some people do research in grayscale images with image processing. They, they love that. They seem to like trying to chop my work down. But uh, there's a few reasons for color. If there, were no, if there was no importance in color, no mammal or no being would have uh, evolved color vision. There must be a use for it. So there's a few of these. The first would be foraging. So if you're looking at food, different fruits, how can you tell if food is in a good condition or fruit is ripe enough to eat? Uh, then also social and sexual signaling, say health reasons. You look at someone's face, you can kind of tell roughly by their color how healthy they are. And going on to material and object recognition. If you're looking for a red ball in a dark room or a well-lit room, you can see it immediately by the color. And if we compare that, that's a kind of more complex task that human visual system carries out and uses color vision for. But current digital imaging tasks are a lot simpler. So you may have basic image recognition maybe using shape, maybe using color, but a lot of these have major problems when used in the real world. So I'm going to focus on one main problem barring this, which is something called color constancy. So you're probably wondering what color constancy is. It's quite, it's a well-known topic, but quite niche. Um, this is the built-in ability of the human visual system to account for changes in illumination to allow the kind of uh, constancy of an object's color to remain across different illuminations. So say you go from uh, early morning sunlight to evening dusk. Your red football always looks like a red football to you. However, if you take that with a camera, if you take an image of the same object under two different light sources, which we would find constancy under, you'll see there's a vast difference in the color uh, the colors being recorded. So you have under two different types of daylight, you see a more yellow daylight, the camera, you can see the yellow haze, and a more bluish daylight. And you can see even with the oranges, the blues, the reds, the recorded colors changed by quite a large amount. So this is a major area of research and a major problem for computer vision systems using RGB cameras. Because if we want to rely on object recognition, obviously we'd want it to work in real world illumination scenarios, which it just can't do at the moment. So in order to uh, do this, obviously the problem has been known about for quite some while. There have been more appro uh, some approaches to solve the problem with RGB cameras based on using, say, image statistics, which is quite common in the image processing field. But obviously, I wouldn't say that our human visual system solely uses that. So an example of some of these statistics would be, uh, say, the gray world algorithm, which says that the average uh, pixel intensity in an image should be gray, which is obviously completely incorrect in certain scenarios. So in order to link together camera imaging, computer vision, and human vision, we have to kind of talk about RGB color image formation. Now, say for a pixel, a given pixel, the R, G, and B channels you get 
for that pixel are a combination of the illumination, the actual surface reflectance, and the camera sensitivity in that channel. Now you can see down here, the actual intensity for each one is the integral of all of those three factors. Now, when we're comparing to human vision, you can say, okay, the illumination will be the same for both, across both problems. Uh, the surface reflectance will be the same across both problems. So the real difference here when comparing the two is the camera sensitivity. So we're comparing the sensitivity of the CCD and of the human retina. So we're only talking about the cones here. So the short, medium, and long wavelength cones. So as you can see, on uh, your right, you can see an average kind of spectral sensitivity for a camera CCD. And you can see there is similarities in terms of um, the two sensitivity graphs. However, there are a number of differences. Within uh, the receptors, you can see there's a greater overlap between the green and the red receptors. Whereas with the camera, you can see there's a much larger difference. Now, obviously, if you think in this way, we can't realistically use camera CCDs to get the exact same signal that our visual system uses. So we're already hobbled at the first stage if we want to use RGB cameras. Now, this can be further um, illustrated by comparing the color gamuts that each of these two sensors, I'll call them, can get. So on your right, you can see the RGB gamut, which you all know and probably love. Um, you can see it collects and you can detect quite a large range of uh, colors. However, when we compare this to the actual colors, the total gamut of colors that can be um, recognized by the human visual system and perceived by us, you can see while it does cover quite an important range of chromaticities, there is a large area which is completely ignored and thus lost to camera. So, I said previously that obviously the RGB camera sensors will never be exactly the same as the human visual system unless, uh, say, sensor design improves vastly. Now, there is one way we can match the sensitivity of the human retina, and that's through a, pro um, a kind of procedure a technique called hyperspectral imaging, which results, it's a camera that for each pixel in an image records the entire irradiance spectrum for that pixel. So what we get, actually get is more information than the human retina gets for that point in space of an image. So actually what we're doing there is surpassing the human retina. So we can then cut down that information and then resolve what the actual human retina would get from that actual irradiance. So, I've said there has been a difference in the camera sensitivities, and we've shown that there is a computer vision method which can equate and equal the human retina. However, what's kind of important for you guys to see here is the real problem and the large deficit in performance with RGB sensors. So I'm going to show how a group of four colors change under different illuminations for a given camera. And you actually, you might be surprised by how much they change. So, the first of this is going to be comparing uh, these four illumination spectra. So these are just four different illuminations with different colors. And we're going to see how they affect the actual recorded uh, chromaticity for a given surface reflectance. So, in order to do this, it will just be a number of different patches, and I'll divide them into the four quadrants there, and compare them to the actual ground truth. So here we can see there's two groups. So here we have the ground truth. It's the same pattern for both. And then for the four different illuminations. And what you can see actually is that for all chromaticities or patches, the actual recorded color varies wildly. And you can imagine that would be quite a major problem when dealing with these systems. So we've talked about the difference in the actual colors being recorded. But the human visual system also has something else up its sleeve. Whereas we might have the same uh, signals with the hyperspectral image and the actual receptor cones, the human visual system also has the act of perception undergoing, so a method of processing and understanding what it's actually seeing. Now, obviously cameras work in RGB and sRGB um, color gamuts, but the problem is a change in coordinates in these gamuts. So say if you go from 255 to 250 in the red, it's not actually a uniform change perceptually. So you may get large changes in RGB which actually can't be perceived by us too well. But you also might have small changes in certain parts which 
to us are perceived as large changes in color. So what we have to do is kind of accept that this happens and uh, start working in spaces which are perceptually correct for the human visual system. So there is a color space which does this. It's called uh, the LAB space. So pretty much this is perceptually uniform in with regards to the Euclidean distance between two points in that space equates directly to the perceptual difference in the colors. So it's very understandable. And it's only actually correct across one illumination. And what that means is that we've said illumination is important for understanding how cameras um, actually record colors, but it's also important for us because there will be certain uh, illuminations where our color perception varies wildly and we won't have color conflicts. There are limits to the process. So this is just an example of the LAB gamma, and you can see it's quite small. Uh, this is the LAB gamma for a monitor that we use in, um, over at the Institute of Neuroscience, so it's been calibrated so we see actually for each RGB triplet what the actual perceptual value for that is. So we can actually calibrate perceptually uh, the value of stimuli on the monitor. So if we have LAB, we know it's perceptual, but all our data is recorded in RGB, which isn't perceptual. We need a method to convert the two so that we can actually use the RGB data. Now, to do this, I've just said we d achieve it through device calibration. So that means we can turn the RGBs into their equivalent LABs, and so we can understand the perceptual significance of any colors. So once we have this, obviously we have perceptual data coming from a camera. However, if we want to base image processing algorithms on perceptual actual uh, procedures in the human visual system, we need to actually replicate what the human visual system does. So say for color constancy, we'll need to actually uh, investigate in certain situations how the human visual system performs, and thus from that work back to actually resolve what it actually does, so what mechanisms exist. So in order to do this, it's just a brief overview. Um, some studies, some that I carry out, uh, have the purpose to either discover the limits of color constancy, so we can see how good the human system is and where it fails, and secondly, to uncover any cues utilized by the human visual system to estimate the illumination, and so become color constant. So some of these cues may be using different contents in the scene. You might use, say, specular highlights, so any actual um, incident reflections of the illumination color in the scene to estimate it. Now, the truth of this is we don't do it uh, knowingly. A lot of it actually may be from learning over time uh, as you evolve from a baby up to an adult, but also some of it might be hardwired into the visual system. So there is an, here's an example of just uh, one type of experiment which is used to gauge the performance of color constancy in human subjects. So this would be a chromatic patch adjustment. So pretty much we ask human subjects to adjust the chromaticity of a patch to achromatic or gray under different illuminations. If they can do this well, obviously we're color constant under that type of illumination. If they can't, the human visual system obviously can't resolve anything under another type of illumination. Now, what we can do, that will show us, without any stimuli in the scene, the basic operation of the system. But if you introduce other control measures, say different stimuli, you can see how different cues actually help or hinder the human visual system and its performance. So, what happens if you do find a significant cue from human systems? Obviously, you need to implement it into an actual image processing algorithm. Once you find out a mechanism that does work, you're going to have to actually exploit it. So in order to do this, we've said previously about the hyperspectral imaging. Uh, what this enables us to do is get the equivalent uh, information going into the human visual system. So if we can study what information is actually going into the human visual system at that time, we could use uh, different uh, algorithms to actually resolve and data mine to see what actual data is helping us in that case. So then we can design algorithms which are using perceptual findings to then actually uh, create an algorithm. So again, just to sum up, we have the applications. Now we've said previously that human visual system evolved color vision 
for a number of reasons, say foraging, health, um, and other things. So if we can manage to do this, we could automate crop and fruit analysis under different illumination uh, scenarios. So at present, uh, fruit analysis systems work in very controlled environments. However, obviously that's not actually usable for mass production of fruit and uh, crops. So if we could actually have systems that work out in the field and can gauge accurately when fruit is ripe or not, it's a big, it's a big money spinner realistically because food production is need to increase massively over the next coming decades. You also have things like health monitoring. Uh, people in the future, people are going uh, wanting to go more towards kind of remote health monitoring of their patients and of other systems. So if we can create sensors that can look for certain characteristics, certain health. Um, signals from, say, analyzing skin remotely. People don't need to go to hospital immediately. They can do a preliminary check at home, get it done, and then if anything needs to be done, they can go into hospital. Again, that would save a lot of money for systems such as the NHS. But also, there's another use. Your cameras, as said before, try and replicate this color constancy with a feature called white balance. Now, have you ever taken any photos where you think, oh, the, color, the colors of my shirt there are a bit off? That's not how I remember it. Now, if we can find a method of um, increasing color constancy in cameras, so improving white balance, it will be great for applications such as in your cameras, in your phones. You will be able to record images that are exactly how you um, perceive them at that time. So again, that will uh, that'd be another big money spinner. People like Apple, Samsung, they're constantly doing research into these areas. So, pretty much just in conclusion, the kind of idea I was putting forward here for the image processing uh, crowd is that if we wish to replicate human vision, we have to study it from the low level up to the high level. So, Zoltan Dertzi was here a few weeks ago talking about the very low level kind of a neuron level of neuroscience, but we go up to the higher level, perceptual level. Now, realistically, if we want to replicate human uh, performance, we need to study all of those and combine them all together in the system. Um, and pretty much, there is a great deal of work still to be carried out in this field, as there is in every field. You can always improve what exists at this present time. So, pretty much, thank you very much. And if you have any questions, feel free. Any questions? Sure. What's the what's the uh, variation in? We don't talk about human perception. Yes. Well, uh, it must be that one person's perception differs from another. Um. Yes, it does. So, how does that factor into your um, idea? The idea of having some sort of corrective algorithm mm -hmm. that converts spectral information into, into perceived information. Indeed. Um, if we wanted to do it on a person-by-person -person basis, we could do that, but it's kind of unachievable. Well, unrealistic. It's achievable, but unrealistic. So if we can uh, get the performance to kind of mean human level, that would definitely be good enough. So a mean um, colour normal human level, that would be absolutely great, fun and dandy. Is, is it known how diverse does that mean in um, terms of colour? For if we're talking about uh, color normal visual um, subjects, pretty much color constancy is quite it's quite constant. To use that horrible word, yeah. It's um, human performance across. I hate, the, hate to use the word constant again, but it is pretty much there is a mean. If anyone has kind of uh, wildly off scale, they may have uh, other other kind of um, visual factors in play. So maybe they're colorblind and don't realize it, or certain other things. But also, we could gauge um, from people who perform badly if they are color normal. We could maybe gauge again mechanisms that aren't working for them, yes. and use that to track back to find out the actual true mechanism. Thanks. Yep. Any more questions? Well, if not, maybe we should uh, thank Peter again. Go get some more doves. Thank <laughs> you.